Welcome again. Today's case is a case for seniors, but I will emphasize a few terms so juniors could learn from them. We're looking at an MRI of a 22-year-old female patient who presented with recurrent seizures. Looking at the patient from her feet, this is anterior, this is posterior, this is right, this is left, and the sequence we're looking at is known as a T2 sequence. Just a reminder of what we talked about previously, on T2, fluid such as CSF here in these cell psi appears bright. On T2, the color of the brain parenchyma is the opposite of what you expect. This here is the white matter, which appears dark, and this here is the cortex or gray matter, which appears brighter. So the relatively bright cortex on T2 covers the undulating surface of the brain and forms what we call gyri. Now let's look quickly at this case. It's very obvious that the abnormality is on the right side. Before we go there, we'll complete a few terms by talking about the normal left side. Very similar to the normal T2 bright CSF of the south side, you have the CSF within the ventricle. This is the lateral ventricle. And here's another fancy term. The lining of the ventricular system is called ependyma. So that's the ependymal lining. Now we know this is the intracranial cavity with the brain, but let's explain a few things uh, at the periphery here. This darker line is the skin. The bright area is fat within the subcutaneous tissue. The very dark area here is part of the muscles overlying the skull. And this band here is the bone with a dark linear cortical line outside and another cortical line inside. So from outside, inside, skin, subcutaneous fat, muscle, and bone. Now once we finish that, between the bone and the brain, you have multiple layers of lining. These are supposed to be the meninges, and the meninges are usually not seen on a normal case, especially without giving intravenous contrast. So what you don't see here from outside, inside, is the dura matter, arachnoid, and pia matter. The dura matter is attached to bone, the pia matter covers the brain, and the arachnoid is in between. Again, for the sake of this case, the immediate coverage of the brain surface is called the pia matter, which means in Latin a tender mother. And the reason the pia matter is called the tender mother because histologically speaking, it's a very thin and delicate membrane. Now that we know all of that, let's talk about the abnormal side. Now that you know that CSF, which is fluid, appears bright on a T2 MRI image, you could tell that there is a track of CSF that connects the outside with the inside. To better describe this, let's call this a CSF cleft. Now let's be more fancy. The CSF communication connects the inner part of the ventricle with the outer brain. Now that you know your terms, you're going to call this a CSF cleft connecting the ependyma with the pia matter. Now the patient had no history of trauma or uh, surgery, and this is consistent with a congenital abnormality. A congenital CSF cleft that connects the ependyma to the pia is known as schizencephaly. Schizencephaly could be unilateral or bilateral, so if you see one, look for the other. It is also associated with other congenital anomalies, so look for other abnormalities. One of the classic features of this abnormality is that this CSF tract is covered by cortex. This is abnormal cortex. Remember that the cortex on a T2-weighted image is uh, brighter than white matter, and here is cortex lining this CSF cleft. This abnormal cortex is typically a um, summation of multiple small 
cortical undulations that are adjacent to each other. Since they are adjacent to each other, they appear as a relatively thickened cortex, and sometimes the interface between this cortex and the white matter is L-defined. Now that you know what this abnormality represents, this abnormal lining of the cortex is understandably called a polymicrogyria. Now with the schizencephaly, you could have the two lips of the abnormality being either opposed, meaning attached to each other, or separated. That's why in books you see that this type of abnormality is divided into two kinds. The first is an open lip schizencephaly, such as this one here. And the second is a closed lip schizencephaly, where the uh, both sides of the track are opposed against each other. When a case has a closed lip type, it's a bit difficult to see sometimes, especially on a CT scan or on some of the MRI acquisitions. What you would like to look for is abnormal cortical extension in a track-like uh, fashion within the brain. Or sometimes the only thing that you could see is this abnormal shape of the ventricle, so this tenting of the ventricle. So for seniors, if you have a side tenting of the ventricle, this may be a sign that this patient has a closed lips schizencephaly. Focal dilatation of a ventricle, if congenital, is called colpocephaly, so that's another fancy term to learn today. Since one congenital anomaly is highly associated with another, look for the other, such as in this patient where the right temporal lobe is abnormal. This is a normally formed left temporal lobe, this is a uh, almost entirely absent right temporal lobe apart from this region here. Here's another fancy term. The medial part that's closer to the midline is called mesial. So this is the mesial temporal lobe. So for the sake of description, here you have uh, absence of the right temporal lobe sparing the mesial aspect. Schizencephaly could be associated with seizures or with developmental delay. So let's summarize what we talked about today. We started by reviewing a few things about the T2-weighted MRI image of the brain. We also learned about these fancy terms, the ependymal layer, the pia mater, schizencephaly, colpocephaly, and just to add another bragging term, we talked about mesial, which is the medial aspect of a structure closer to the midline. And don't forget that schizencephaly is lined by abnormal cortex typically polymicrogyria that appears as thickened cortex. Trick for seniors, always look for tenting of the uh, ventricle to make sure you're not missing a case of closed lip schizencephaly. I hope this case was useful. Thanks for watching. I'd appreciate your feedback and comments as usual, and let's see you with more cases later. Welcome back everybody. This is a quick case uh, that's mainly dedicated for juniors, but there is a uh, teaching point for the more senior audience. This is a five-year-old male patient who has chest pain. One of the basic teachings uh, when you read a chest x-ray is to look at everything in a systematic way. And that includes uh, an area that could be easily missed, which is the soft tissues at the periphery of the film, such as the soft tissues at the neck area. The abnormality is located here. And to understand this, let's talk a little bit about the five basic densities you could see on a chest radiograph. The first density is this dark density of air, such as what you see within the lungs. Second density is the density of soft tissues, and that includes what you see here over the diaphragm or the cardiac structures. The soft tissue at the periphery of the film is also part of the soft tissue densities. The third density is that of fat density, which is a color that's uh, higher than air, but lower than soft tissues. For example, you see the uh, soft tissue densities here, and you see this line that's more lucent and dark. This is that of fat. The fourth density is that of calcium, such as what you see here in the uh, bones of the spine or the ribs. And finally, a very high density that we don't see here, which is metallic density, such as surgical clips or wires. So the five densities are air, soft tissue, fat, calcium, and metallic.
Now that you know that the subcutaneous area should contain soft tissue densities or fat densities, you'll notice that this area looks a little bit different and abnormal. The subcutaneous area has this heterogeneous appearance from these uh, rounded and uh, reticular lucencies, and the lucencies are those of air density. You could actually see the abnormality on uh, both sides of the neck, and uh, this is consistent with air within the subcutaneous tissue known as subcutaneous emphysema or another term is surgical emphysema so that's air within the subcutaneous tissues here's the practical point if you see subcutaneous emphysema you should make sure you're not missing emphysema within other compartments by other compartments i mean the pleura the mediastinum and the heart that's pneumothorax pneumomediastinum and pneumopericardium so looking carefully you'll notice that you have these thin air lucencies that are tough to see on each side of the mediastinum. In a similar way you see another air lucency here adjacent to the spine in the posterior mediastinum in the paraspinal location. Consistent with air within the mediastinum known as pneumomediastinum. So take a chance to look at this. And make sure that there is no pneumothorax or pneumopericardium. In this case, the patient had neither. So in this quick case, we emphasize that you have to look systematically at everything on the chest X-ray and don't forget the peripheral soft tissues. We talked about the five big densities that you could see on a chest X-ray, emphasizing the appearance of air lucency. Bubbly, streaky, or linear air lucencies within the subcutaneous tissue is consistent with subcutaneous emphysema. A practical point, if you see subcutaneous emphysema, make sure you don't have pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, or pneumopericardium. Remember that pneumomediastinum could be very subtle if you don't look carefully for it, such as what we saw in this case. This patient was actually asthmatic, had severe cough, which resulted in pneumomediastinum and subcutaneous emphysema subsequently. Talk about it, this would be a good chance for you to read about all the causes of subcutaneous emphysema and pneumomediastinum. Thanks for watching. Uh, your feedback is appreciated as usual, and we'll see you with more cases next week.